from Hollywood. It's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Oh, oh yes. Is this Inspector Saylor, Scotland Yard? Oh, yes, Inspector. Thanks for calling back. I understand you've been assigned to Scott Jewel theft investigation? Yes. Inspector Finley has been taken ill. I was given the case this morning. As a matter of fact, I just received the file with your request to telephone. Well, that puts us about abreast then, Inspector. I got in from the States last night. I'd like to get together with you so we could compare notes. Yes, splendid. Uh, could you come to my office? At your convenience. Well, then, uh, why don't you come right over? But first, Mr. Dollar, tell me. Did the insurance company send you to London in the belief that the yard is no longer competent? What? We've been reminded, you know, that our reputation has fallen off badly since the stone of scorn has stolen. But perhaps you and I shall have better luck, huh? Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Financial Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Hatchet House theft matter. Expense account item one, $432.50, airfare and incidentals between Hartford and London, England. I arrived in the evening and learned by phone that the original inspector assigned to the case had been replaced. The next morning, I was in contact with his replacement, and at 10.30, I was directed to his office. Here we are, sir. Inspector Saylor's? Yeah? Mr. Dollar, sir. Oh, yes. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Thanks very much. All right, you are, sir. Ah, uh, pleasure, Mr. Dollar. How do you do, Inspector? Yeah. I, uh, speaking to an acquaintance of yours a few moments ago. Inspector Finch? Oh, yes. Yes, I worked on a case with him over here last year. How is he? Oh, quite well, thank you. He complimented you quite highly, sir. Well, that's very nice of him. But as I remember it, I think I was more of a burden than a help to him. Well, I doubt that. Well, I suppose we should face the situation at hand. Yeah. I uh, brought an accurate description of all the jewelry insured by Mrs. Scott. Oh, splendid. But the cable that reported the theft wasn't quite clear as to which pieces were missing. Mm -hmm. Inspector Finley's information on that score is quite accurate, I think. There we are. Oh, thank you. And he's covered the methods used in the commission of the crime quite thoroughly, I think. I'm going to spend the afternoon crime index. I should probably be able to link the method with a few of our known criminals. Gentleman's investigation, huh? <laughs> I suppose so. Rather tedious, but quite often successful. I'd like to see Mrs. Scott myself, if it's all right with you. Oh, of course. I shall arrange a car and a driver for you. Will uh, early afternoon be suitable? Well, thanks, but there's no reason to go to that father, is there? Isn't she staying here in London? No, she left a place near Seven Oaks in Surrey. About 20 miles south of here. Quite an historic establishment, I'm told. It's called Hatchet House. Before I left London that afternoon, Inspector Sailors and I pulled the few facts we had. I was able to tell him that Mrs. Marcella Scott, reputedly a wealthy Texas widow, was actually slightly on her uppers as far as ready cash went. She had sold some jewelry the previous year for considerably less than its insured value. He gave me the news that Mrs. Scott frequently had been seen in the company of another American tourist named Norman King. And together, we figured the loss at slightly over $100,000. Hatchet House was a medium-sized pile of ivy-draped masonry just on the northern fringe of Seven Oaks. In addition to history, it boasted some seclusion being set back from the road in the middle of a walled garden. Mrs. Scott was in the village, but was expected back momentarily, and would I care to come in and wait? The library is quite comfortable, if you'd care to go in there. In a minute, thanks. Your name is Garrett? Yes, sir. You've been employed here during Mrs. Scott's old stay? Oh, yes, sir. She bought my services from the other side. I'm not without recommendations in Seven Oaks, sir. And you must know pretty well who's been in the house at parties and so on. I'd say so, sir. But they've all been genuine people. Class, you know... I wouldn't say that any of them would stoop to thievery. How many other servants are there? Two that live in. There's Millie Hankey. She's a maid. There's old Mr. Minns. He's the gardener. 
Uh, he's got a cottage out back. Mrs. Scott was entertaining night before last when the jewelry was stolen. Had she hired any extra servants? No, sir. Oh, thanks, Karen. Oh, uh, there's Millie. Millie, come here, do. Here's an American gentleman to see you. How do you do, sir? You know, Miss Hankey? Yes, sir. He's come all the way from the other side, Millie, about Mrs. Scott's jewels being stolen. It's a scandal, that's what it is. But I don't suppose you'd say it's the only one. Uh, watch your tongue, Millie. Watching it. I'll be in the pantry, sir, if I can be of any more service to you. Thanks, Garrett. I will want the names of the people who were here the other night. Right, sir. I'll write them on a paper. He's got a nerve telling me to watch my tongue. A scandal's a scandal. Genuine people are not, and he knows it. Just what did you mean, Millie? I suppose the servants paid to keep her eyes open and her mouth closed. But I haven't been a servant long. I'm only a village girl from Penrith, but I know right from wrong. You don't approve of some of the things? No, I don't. And I'm going to leave when I get married. Maybe next month. Hmm. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. He's a good man. I'm sure of that. So big and strong. Lots of fun. We'll have an inn of our own someday, and I won't have to be a servant anymore. I oh, wish you a lot of luck. Thank you, sir. I want you to know, Millie, that anything you say to me will be kept in strict confidence. Yes, sir. You look like the honest kind. Now, what things especially didn't you approve of? Something that's caught your eye could be important. I don't know, but one thing. Being a widow at her age, it's indecent, that's what. And I've seen them making jokes in front of the photo of her poor dead husband. He was older, you know. Yes, I knew that. I can't say she hastened his end. But I can't say she's sorry he's buried and gone either. Who made jokes in front of his photograph? Mr. King. Norman King. He was here the night of the theft, wasn't he? The night of the theft. He's been here more than he's elsewhere. He's a filthy leech, if you ask me. I'm only a country girl, but there's a look in his eyes I didn't mistake. Not for a moment. He's slimy. I wish you'd think about the party night before last, Millie. You were here on the ground floor through most of it, weren't you? Yes, sir, the whole drunken time. Uh, I wish you'd try and remember if anybody went upstairs and stayed long enough to have gone into Mrs. Scott's room and forced open the drawer and stolen the jewelry. I'll try, sir. Don't mistake me. We aren't sure that's what happened. It could just as well have been an outsider who knew a party was going on and had a way of entry, or even somebody passing by who found the rear door unlocked. I'll try, sir. Thanks, Millie. I won't keep you from your work any longer. I'll just wait in the library for Mrs. Scott. I waited an hour until the butler, Garrett, notified me that Marcella Scott had phoned. She had met some friends in the village, had driven to London with them, and wouldn't return until the next morning. I could find her any time after nine that night at Claridge's Hotel. I spent another 20 minutes with the servants and left for London and Inspector Saylor's office. Turn before this, Mr. Dawson. I hope I didn't keep the car and driver too long. No, not at all. Especially if the time was well spent. Uh, most of it was wasted. While I waited for Mrs. Scott in Hatchet House, she was on her way to London. Oh? Huh? She's here now? Uh, Claridge's. She came in with friends. Well, doesn't seem to be upset over her loss, does she? Nor the loss of her husband either, I take it. Oh? Huh? I'm interested in the association between her and this Norman King. I see. Then you did have a talk with Miss... Mildred Hankey, the maid, hmm? Uh, yes, I did. Why? Did you? No. Inspector Finlay did. What did he say about it? Well, she suffered from an insane hate or jealousy because of this Mr. Keaton. I didn't see it quite that way. That she berated the friendship shared by Mrs. Scott and him. This is uh, what he jotted down. Investigate... Possibility of collusion between Hanky Girl and King. Well, as I said, I didn't see it that way, but maybe he hit something. Yep. King's from New York. I'm going to make a phone call, see what I can learn about his background. In the meantime, I hope to meet him. At least I think he's here with Mrs. Scott. You're going to see her then? Her message was that I could any time after nine. I plan to be available about two minutes after. I shall be interested to hear. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, get anything from your files? Nothing. Dreadfully and absolutely nothing. At five minutes before nine, I arrived at Mrs. Scott's hotel. 
On the stroke of nine, I phoned her suite, and at three minutes after, I met her, a striking honey blonde with tanned skin and an athletic figure that dressed her clothes nicely. I'm sorry I missed you in the country, Mr. Dollar. It's all right. I should have phoned. I suppose you're here to save what money you can for the insurance company in case my things aren't recovered. Insurance companies don't operate that way, Mrs. Scott. They can afford not to. Please sit down. Thank you. It's the expected thing, I guess. But I suspect one of the servants had something to do with it. Do you have any special reason for that suspicion? Oh, they're strange people. I don't know anything about them. I've had them two months, and I've never been comfortable with them around me. Anything else? Well, the more I thought of it, the more it seems to make sense. The house was full of people to be suspected. One of them could have taken advantage of that. The men at Scotland Yard say that it took between 15 and 20 minutes to force that drawer open the way it was done. Did you miss either of your servants for that length of time? Not that I remember. It got a little confused by 11 or so. Do you suspect anybody else, any of your guests? Oh, good Lord, no. Most of them have a lot more than I do. Did you know Norman King in the States, or did you meet him here? Are you telling me suspect Norman? I asked when you met him. Why? I wondered if you knew him well enough to know he is a record as a forger. I don't believe it. Checks. He signed the name of another widow. A copy of the record is being mailed to me. I don't care. doesn't make any difference. Norman didn't steal my jewelry. He wouldn't do that to me. I wonder how many times the other widow said that. You don't understand me. Norman and I are the same kind of people. You don't think I married a 70-year-old Texan for love, do you? Well, Norman's made up his mind what he wants out of life, too. He's talked about it. He doesn't care how he gets it, but he wouldn't take it from me. Sure. Well, I wanted to meet you, Mrs. Scott, and I have. Norman King checked into the Dorchester yesterday. He checked out today, and now Scotland Yard can't find him. If you hear from him, maybe you'd better let us know. Johnny Dollar. Inspector Saylor. Oh, hello. I'm sorry I took so long to answer. I just got up to my room. Yes, uh, well, I, I spoke to the clerk at the desk. He thought you might be going up, and I asked mm. him to ring. You saw Mrs. Scott? Yes, I didn't learn much, but I don't think she's mixed up in it. No. Well, perhaps I have some news for you. What's that? I just received a report of a killing in Limehouse. The constable described a piece of jewelry found at the scene, and it uh, corresponds quite closely to the description of Mrs. Scott's emerald brooch. Oh, who was killed? Uh, no identification yet. A man. I'm driving over. I wondered if you'd like me to pick you up. Yes, I would. I'll be waiting in front of my hotel. We will return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. What is the secret of Dr. Walter? Sorry, we don't have the answer, but we know where it can be found. Tomorrow night, over most of these same CBS stations, with a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The unique theater of thrills called Suspense looks into the eerie matter of Dr. Walter's private life. Another thrilling CBS suspense drama, tomorrow night. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. By the time we got to the dismal cold water flat near the Thames, the inevitable crowd had gathered in the street. The body was one flight up in a grubby room that showed plenty of signs that a struggle had taken place. The man obviously had been killed by a blow on the back of the head. He'd been identified by the landlady as George Kenzie, the renter of the room. It was a boot black who discovered the body. Said this George Kenzie owed him some money and wouldn't pay. He came up here tonight and found him dead. I found the brooch myself just under the chair there, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you, Constable. All right, sir. I'll be outside. Here now, you people that don't belong here. Don't crowd the corridor. Move along now. Come along. Move along. Is there any doubt in your mind, Mr. Dollar, that this is Mrs. Scott's brooch? None at all. Look, the jeweler's mark on the back. Well, then, we've made some progress. I hardly think we'd be so fortunate as to find the four remaining pieces here. No. Offhand, it looks like there was trouble over dividing the loot, and the winner took the rest, don't you think? 
Quite possibly. Norman King? I'd feel better if he was found. Uh, so would I. Matter of fact, I wish you'd keep your American criminals in America. We've quite enough to keep us busy without them. Get your ruddy hands oh, off me. Hello. Oh, you haven't done nothing. We're going to Mr. Kinsey's digs with me out in free will, and I don't need no help from nobody. Not off you, don't. Miss Glory Stokes, Inspector. She said she'd come to pay a visit to Mr. Kenzie, but she made off the other way when she heard the news. Well, come in, Miss Stokes. I will not. Not with him lying there like that. Very well. Constable, ask Miss Stokes if she'll please accompany you to the yard. Mr. Dollar and I will see her there. I suppose it's understood that when you're with Scotland Yard, you do as Scotland Yard does. We didn't search the place, but we learned it was empty of any more jewelry after a crew of technical men collected every possible bit of physical evidence in the room and started it towards the Yard's various laboratories. The results of their meticulous tests, comparisons, and examination fell into place later. We asked a few questions there without getting anything and then went back to the inspector's office where Glory Stokes waited for us. I trust we haven't kept you waiting too long. This is Mr. Dollar, American investigator. How do you do? What would he be investigating that would concern me? We'll explain the whole thing to you, Miss Stokes. It ain't Miss Stokes. If something tells me I'm going to wish it was. You're married? I am. That's why I was going to George Kinsey. I haven't seen me Abby for three days. And I was going to ask George if he knew where the rotter was. What's your husband's name? Leonard Stokes. You haven't seen him in three days. That's right. Couldn't he give you any idea where he was going? No, why should he? I don't care where he goes and he knows it. But you said you were looking for him. I was. If he's going to desert his poor wife, she's got a right to know, hasn't she? Yeah, I suppose she has. I take it he spent quite a lot of time with his George Kenzie. Yeah, too much if you ask me. George was no good. He was a thief. I knew he'd end up dead like this. And if I told Leonard once, I told him a hundred that he'd get into trouble if he chummed with him. He is in trouble. Ain't he in trouble? Uh, we aren't sure yet, Mrs. Stokes. What kind of trouble? Some jewelry was stolen from a woman in Seven Oaks. Jewels? Oh, uh... One of the pieces was found in George Kenzie's room. There's still almost a hundred thousand dollars worth missing. More than thirty thousand pounds, Mrs. Stokes. Thirty thousand? George did that. It looks like it. There's a possibility that your husband was involved also. Leonard! Ah, don't make me laugh. He wouldn't have the brain. The next morning, armed with pictures of both Stokes and the dead man, Inspector Sailors and I drove back to Seven Oaks. He dropped me at Hatchet House and went on to cover the village himself. Mrs. Scott received me in the library. Good morning, Mr. Dollar. Mrs. Scott, you must have left London early this morning. Yes, I did. Have you made any progress? Some, yes. Have you heard anything? I was very unhappy after you left last night. Why? Did you suddenly get lonesome for your jewels? I think you know why. I made a confession to you. I let you see what I really am. I never do that. It's all in confidence. Forget it. I've been trying to. I got a radiogram from Norman King. It arrived here late yesterday afternoon. Did you notify Scotland Yard? No, I know you asked me to, but I didn't think it was necessary. He's on his way back to New York. He wouldn't do that with stolen jewelry, would he? It would be stupid, but I'll want the name of the ship. I'll give it to you. He inferred that he knew his record would come to light because of the theft and that he'd feel better leaving England before he was asked to leave. He's a stupid, irresponsible dunce. Yeah. I have some photographs I want you to look at. Here, I'll spread them out on the table. Who are they? Uh, pictures of this man may not be quite lifelike because he was dead when they were taken. Uh, who is he? His name is George Kenzie. He was found beaten to death last night. Your emerald brooch was on the floor near him, so we're assuming he was killed because of your jewelry. You ever seen this man around here? No, not that I remember. Well, I want you to remember one way or the other. It's possible that this man just received the stolen property from someone else, but if we can find somebody in the house or in the village who recognizes him, then we'll feel sure that he actually was the thief, or one of them anyway. I'm trying to be sure. What about the other one? I don't think I've seen either of them. And if you'll leave the room, I'd like to talk to your servants. 
You're going out of your way to be nasty. You thoroughly despise me, don't you? No. What I dislike is the fact that the physical part of you wasn't matched up with some mental apparatus that deserved it. Why? You asked me a personal question, Mrs. Gunn. No. Oh. I want you to look at the photographs and think. It's important that we find out if you have ever seen either of these men in Seven Oaks. Which one is deceased, sir? This one. Hmm. How large was he? A little under six feet. Miss Hanky? I don't like looking at them, sir. I don't think I've seen either one of them, though. There's something about this one, sir. George Kenzie? Was he plump? No, I don't think you'd say plump. He was heavy, stocky. There's something about him, sir. Can't put my finger quite on it, but there's something. Could he have made deliveries here? Who brought the luggage, Millie, the day after Mrs. Scott arrived? Oh, I don't think it was him. Or this one either. They had their own lorry with a sign on it. Have you forgot? I'm sure of it, sir. There's something about this one, but I can't remember what. Oh... Thanks very much, both of you. If you do remember something, please notify Scotland Yard. In the village, Inspector Sailors had found a few people who thought they recognized George Kenzie and two who were positive. None of them had recognized Leonard Stokes. So by the time we had left Seven Oaks, we were fairly sure that Kenzie had been actively involved. But since he was dead, being sure didn't mean any progress. further developed that day, although in London a stream of suspects was questioned. The next morning the situation hadn't changed, but I began to feel that in the face of the movement of Scotland Yard, a criminal would have to have more than brains and more than luck to escape. At two that afternoon, a report was phoned in that a man answering the description of Leonard Stokes had been seen boarding a train in Waterloo Station and followed to his compartment. Another call delayed the train so that Inspector Sailors and I were able to get aboard. Don't mind, Stoller. It's your island, Inspector. Yes, thank you. Scotland Yard. What? Are you Leonard Stokes? Am I? Who? No, I'm not. Who are you then, sir? Well, I don't see how you have a right to you go. You must have identification. Let me see it, please. All right. I'm Leonard Stokes. Who's he? An American, Mr. Dollar. Sent here to recover Mrs. Scott's stolen property. You know where it is, Stokes? Answer him. It's all right, all right. I know when I'm beat. Yes, I know where it is. But I didn't kill George. How did you know he was dead, Mr. Stokes? Well, I tried to telephone him. That's how I found out. He was killed because of the jewelry, wasn't he, Stokes? I don't know. I don't know why he was killed. When was the last time you saw him, Mr. Stokes? Tuesday night. You went to Seven Oaks? I went to Seven Oaks, yes. Look, I'm willing to cooperate. Inspector, I'll, t- I'll-, I'll tell you my part of it. Well, that will make it a great deal less difficult for all of us. Yes, sir. Well, he asked me to go to Seven Oaks with him. I, I didn't know what he was up to. I-, I thought we was just going for a little drive. Out of five pieces missing, Stokes, we found one in Kenzie's room. Now, if you know where the rest of them are, you must have known what he was up to. Well, if I had, I wouldn't have gone. That's the truth. Before I knew it, he stopped off at this hatchet house and told me to wait in the motor. He must have explained why he stopped. Well, he said he had a friend to see, a gardener. A gardener at Hatchet House? That's what he told me. He came back in a while and then we drove off. And you still didn't know what was happening? No. When did you? When it was too late. On the road back to London, he told me. He told me whether I knew it or not, I'd just stolen some jewels. Well, I thought he was joking. Then he showed them to me and he says, Who's going to believe you, Len, boy, when you say you didn't know nothing about it? Oh, what could I do? What did you do? I drove back to London. Why was there only one piece of jewellery in Kenzie's room? Well, that's all he took. Said he wanted to give it to a chum. And you took care of the rest of it? Well, I was afraid to do anything else, sir. He kept telling me I was complicated in it. Stokes' innocence, as far as the robbery was concerned, became a little embarrassing even to him by the time we got him off the train and back to Scotland Yard. But his denial of any knowledge of Kenzie's murder was borne out, A, by an alibi that proved him innocent, and B, 
The result of one of the laboratory tests mentioned earlier. Traces of lip rouge found on the dead man's clothing pointed the way to the murderer. Mrs. Scott is resting in her room and left orders not to be disturbed. We won't disturb her, Garrett. Is Miss Hanky here? She's in the pantry, sir. Would you show us? This way, please. Thank you, Garrett. Oh, Mr. Dollar. This is Inspector Sailors from Scotland Yard, Miss Hanky. Miss Hanky. How do you do? You've come after me, haven't you? Yes, I think we have. I don't mind. I don't care about it. Anything now. You did recognize the photographs of George Kenzie, didn't you? Recognize them? Yes, I suppose so. I remembered. I remembered the man I fell in love with. I told you I was going to marry, didn't I, Mr. Dollar? You met him in Seven Oaks? Yes. He told me he lived in London. And I felt like a child. I'd never gotten to know anyone who lived in London. When you're born in Penrith, you never do. He was so nice. He could talk so I could listen all night. <clears throat> Did he question you concerning Mrs. Scott? He took me to London. And he told me he wanted to marry me. And I believed him. Millie, really, we're sorry. I wanted a husband the same as every girl. But he was lying. He knew I was a servant. And he found out about things. Then inadvertently you told him about the entertainment Tuesday night. The party? He said it was going to come. I left the rear door unlocked because I was going to give him some refreshments. I thought he hadn't come. But he had. He lied to me. That's why I killed him. You went to London last night? Yes. He told me to leave London. He told me to go back to Penrith. Then I knew that he'd lied to me and that he'd stolen the jewelry. He called me a stupid country girl. And that's when I hit him. I hit him and hit him. Because it was true. That's all I am. A servant. And I'll never be anything else. Account item two, miscellaneous, $317.75. Item three, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $1,182.75. Remarks, the jewelry was recovered, but in spite of its value, that didn't seem too important. The importance, as I saw it, lay in the complete reversal of values. Mildred Hankey, who only wanted goodness, had found badness. And Marcella Scott? <sighs> Marcella Scott left for Capri the following day. It was truly Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were John McIntyre, Ben Wright... Tudor Owen, Jeanette Nolan, and Virginia Gregg. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dan Coverley inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Tonight's the last Bing Crosby show of the season on CBS. What's more, Ken Murray, his pretty blonde songbird, Lori Anders, and folk singer, Burl Ives, are all on hand to help the groaner ring down the curtain. Stay tuned for the Bing Crosby show next on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.